Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Get Your Technology Commercial Ready. This is the fourth and final event of our four-part FDA webinar series. And I'm Rebecca Norman, your, web, your moderator and webinar organizer today. I work at the Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center as Innovation Consultant. We are taxpayer funded to provide consulting, training, and market research services for clients statewide. This life science commercialization webinar series, which began last month, was funded through a federal and state technology award from the Small Business Administration in order to address identified needs for our life science businesses and entrepreneurs. The ASB TDC offers high value market research services as well as guided support for innovative companies interested in exploring federal opportunities through the Small Business Innovation Research Funding Program. I want to let everyone know that you will receive a copy of today's slides as well as a link to the webinar recording within two days of this event. And before we start, let's take a moment to make sure everyone's ready and familiar with the GoToWebinar program. You, you should notice that you have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can minimize this panel by clicking on the red arrow button in the upper corner and expand the panel by clicking on that same button. And we do encourage you to submit questions throughout today's presentation. You'll do this using the question pane, which is located near the bottom of your control panel. Um, once you open that up, you can just type in your question and hit send, and I'll receive that. Um, we'll hold on to the questions till the end of this event, and when we'll have 30 minutes for a Q&A session. <clears throat> so with that, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> today's panelist is Jeff Skiba. Jeff has over 28 years of experience leading medical device development and commercialization of first-to-market concepts. Jeff is an inventor on over 25 domestic and international patents related to cardiovascular, orthopedic, OBGYN, and treatment of biologic tissue. He has authored and successfully received FDA clearance on multiple orthopedic and OBGYN devices. Jeff created Romeris Innovations Incorporated in 2004. He assigned his intellectual property and eventually capitalized the company, bringing in over 70 investors and raising over 12 million in private equity investment. He is the inventor of Romeris's Procellera wound dressing with microcurrent technology. Jeff was director of manufacturing and engineering at Trivascular, which is a California startup company where he was involved in the development of a percutaneously delivered abdominal aortic aneurysm repair endograft, a FDA class three PMA device. Jeff founded JBS Bioengineering, a startup company where he served as president. He headed the design and the development of the surgical implant sector, where he was responsible for the development of a urologic implant system for type three stress incontinence this was funded by a grant from the Office of Chief Scientist in Israel and developed within an Israeli medical device firm. That device was granted FDA clearance as well as two patents. Jeff developed a unique system for eye medication delivery. He served as Vice President of Manufacturing and Engineering at Orthopedic Biosystems Incorporated. At this startup company, he directed the formation of the Research and Development Department, Inventory Management, Regulatory Submissions, and a world-class quality system approved by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, and products stamped with a CE mark for orthopedic deep tissue implants and instrumentation. This company was eventually acquired by Smith & Nephew, an international orthopedic distribution company. Jeff was founder and manager of technical services at International Polymer Engineering in 1992, where he was responsible for the research and development of expanded PTFE polymers and expanded PTFE production methods. Jeff, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and I appreciate uh, everyone attending and uh, listening to this uh, this uh, last uh, um, webinar. It's it's more of a, uh, a summary as well as additional information and uh, what you what we were re reviewing. Let's see what we were reviewing is. Uh, Preparation for the design transfer uh, to manufacturing and commercialization. Uh, preparing to commercialize uh, the product is really a, a critical phase in the 
in the process of, that started with somebody's idea. And uh, it's, in the first session, we talked about ideation and how uh, products are conceived of and how they move through a, uh, um, a design process, which under the uh, regulations of the FDA must be very well documented. And um, in, in addition, from a business standpoint, you need to uh, protect your product. So uh, how, and, and part of this uh, presentation will be on how to protect yourself uh, and protect your, your company. Um, and one of the ways that that's going to be done is through intellectual property, patents, trademarks, proprietary information. This is stuff that you uh, just want to, these are called trade secrets. Um, you're going to talk a little bit about more about the need for additional funding, which uh, unfortunately that, that's, uh, that is what goes on in small businesses. However, how you get that funding and when you take the funding is, is important. And pre pre preparing not to be eaten by investors and uh, waking up one day and find out your entire company is gone. Uh, developing a functional business plan, knowing your market size, Establishing a board of advisors early, and these are these are very specific uh, uh, advisors. This just isn't a group of, of doctors. It's not a group of business guys. You try to uh, you try to spread that out over your needs, and so a needs analysis early on of what you need. If it's quality assurance, regulatory affairs. If it's a business guy, somebody with good business acumen. Um, <clears throat> there are many many retired businessmen who are out there who would love to be involved in a small company, startup company, and uh, they have these little organizations throughout all the big big cities where you can call these guys up and they can help you uh, structure the, uh, the business early. Uh, distribution, um, at this point because we are preparing to commercialize, getting someone in who understands how to distribute the products that you're, that you're looking at, uh, finance, uh, how to how to take it to the next level to where when you're when you're bringing in additional cash you're not you're not killed on that. Uh, insurance is another big aspect of preparing to commercialize. Is uh, you need to have insurances in place before you launch your product, um, mainly because of your product liability. If it is a medical device, it needs you need to have product liability in, in the event you're sued. You need to have business interruption uh, insurance in case somebody. Um, uh, leaves or uh, uh, causes an issue or uh, heaven forbid somebody uh, passes away. Uh, directors and officers, the DNO insurance and the ENO errors and omissions insurance, those are important especially if you've brought in um, investors because these investors uh, have the right uh, as, a, as shareholders to sue you at any time and uh, this, this insurance uh, will protect you personally. Um, by uh, um, providing the funds necessary to hire attorneys. Uh, the effects of changes in design at a very late stage, and we went over that in, in, in uh, session three, about what the, what the cost of the changes of design. If you, the, the, late, the longer you wait to make your changes, the more expensive it's going to be to, um, to the company because you have to go back and do a, a, an awful lot of stuff. We'll discuss this a little bit later. And whether or not this, this change would require a refiling with the FDA, that may turn the clock back for you. So you have to really understand if your product is going to change, what, uh, what effect does that have on the FDA? Uh, a, a continuous research uh, pro process can, in, in FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, allows you to go in and ask for, for copies of other people's work that may have been submitted to to the uh, government agencies. However, uh, the, uh, the the sad part of this, it could take up to six months to get that information. If it's already been issued and redacted, you could probably see it in a couple of months. But it does take a while, so you have to put that into your timeline uh, if it's important that you pull that in that research into your into your process. That's why in in the very first uh, uh, webinar we were talking about pulling in the research and having. Uh, having that available early on. Uh, that's competitive competition as well as, uh, as, well as uh, papers and uh, research and any uh, meta-analyses that may have been done that apply to your, to your uh, product. Um, focus on adding value as quickly as possible and we're going to go into that as to why, why that's important. Uh, the, the more value you can add, uh, the, the more you can ask for your for your uh, uh, percentages if you're if you're uh, selling percentages in the company, 
it's it's like a it's like a pie. You want your pie to be as big as possible. If somebody takes a small slice, it's not as as bad as if it's a small pie and they take the whole thing. The goal is the ultimate goal in in all of this is product acceptance in a in a limited market and uh, uh, and then of course increasing your sales. Uh, in, in the effects of this last minute de change design, I wanted to go on that just, just briefly. Um, and it happens in business. And this was one I just found the other day. Elon Musk drove his engineers insane when he demanded a last minute design change to the Tesla Model S. He decided that the tires didn't look good on the back of the car. He wanted wider ones. And uh, the engineers had to uh, figure out how to uh, put the wide tires on. And fortunately, the design was was robust enough for them to put these tires and 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 make the change. It did cost them because uh, they'd already purchased all the other tires, so they had, to, they had to set those aside and put these new tires on. Um, in in the case of a medical device, however, we have to not just look at that part. This is called we call this uh, the product effectivity or the effect e effectivity of the change having to do with our documentation system as well as our product itself and, uh, and the production process to make it. If you make a, a, a design change and your production process is already in place, you may have to go out and buy new equipment. Then you have to go back and validate and um, verify that your machines work and go back through the entire process again. Um, you need to reassess all the testing, biocompatibility, toxicology, and reassess the labeling and marketing information, packaging and sterilization, shelf life, and the, the cost that this is going to incur as a result. So I guess the bottom line is make your changes early, get to a frozen design that everyone is happy with, and the only way to do that is through effective communication with all parties and, and good documentation so that at the end of the day, the, the, the changes are minimal. Build a business plan. And this is one of the ways that uh, you can you can avoid these last minute changes. And the business plans, there's a lot of places out there. Uh, I like this one, uh, uh, sample business plans uh, on bplans.com. Uh, there's also uh, a how to write a business plan. Here's a method that doesn't that doesn't actually suck. Uh, there are others. There's many different places you can go on business plans, but you do do need to have one. And uh, um, it, uh, it's uh, it is a is a perfect exercise to uh, answer a lot of these questions going forward, especially if you're bringing in uh, investors. Have a reimbursement strategy. This is this is probably uh, one of the places where a lot of people uh, in, in medical devices, at least, uh, don't understand the process as well as they should. Uh, reimbursement in medical devices uh, is is a difficult thing to achieve um, and about 80 percent of the devices that are out there do not have uh, reimbursement in, 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 the, in our, in our uh, uh, industry, in the medical device industry, all of our reimbursement seems to go through um, Medicare and uh, under the uh, CMS, the Centralized Medical System. And once Medicare has, has uh, reviewed the product, they assign that a uh, HCPCS code, and uh, as opposed to uh, a uh, CPT code, and this, the uh, HCPCS code is a unique identifier for the product. Now, how do you get those? Well, you have to submit your product. Um, um, you have to submit your your application to the CMS, and they are going to look at your product based upon your uh, FDA classification. So this is where the FDA strategy has to um, uh, has to work with uh, uh, with the reimbursement strategy. Uh, if you're if you're going to file a 510k, the 510k will give you a uh, a classification code uh, based upon your predicate device, uh, something that you're comparing your device to. If you're filing a de novo or a, a PMA, you will be creating a new uh, classification code, and you can uh, negotiate then with Medicare for for that uh, reimbursement amount. Now the uh, th th this is a this is an entirely different uh, uh, discussion, and there are people out there who specialize in these reimbursement strategies and and getting it through the uh, CMS. However, 
if you if you do go down the 510k route, be aware that if, if, if there's something out there, let's say your predicate is a very simple device that has very low reimbursement, when you get that code, that's the most that you can ask for it. So it, it, it's going to have an impact on your uh, uh, your ability to uh, to uh, price your product. And if your price is too high, then somebody has to pay the difference. That's either the patient or the doctor. If you're under a CPT code, that's a little bit different. That's That CPT code is a procedural code, and so you're covered underneath the blanket of the of the um, of the procedure, and if uh, I'll give you an example, if the procedure is a five thousand dollar procedure, and and the surgeon that's the max, it's a capped uh, procedure. If the surgeon gets um, five thousand dollars for that, he can get reimbursed for that. Then the rest of the procedure has to be covered either by the patient, which is uh, which is what you see on your bills when when they come back and they say this is what was covered by your insurance. And here's your your uh, um, here's your deductible, and here's your other the other part which is not covered by insurance, and uh, that is a that is a uh, a strategy, and that is possible to do that. So uh, it's just a matter of being aware and having your people, your your marketing and sales people, be aware of where where that strategy is. Go on to some of these <coughs> excuse me some of these websites, and you will see. Uh, and medical device websites, you will see sections where they steer you through uh, how you get reimbursed because that is a, a major question uh, in the sales um, uh, process uh, and it's probably one of the first questions. How do I get reimbursed? And if you're talking to a physician on your device, uh, their, their question will be, how do I make money in this? If I use your product, can I make money? Um, I wanted to go through the coding coverage and payment. This is uh, uh, very important to understand in, in the reimbursement process. Uh, coding is what it can be used for. Uh, coverage is what procedure can it be used in, and payment is whether or not <coughs> excuse me, is whether or not the the insurance company will pay in full or partial. And most insurance companies, if not all of them, look back to Medicare for their uh, reimbursement. Uh, um, uh, code to see if they've reimbursed it. That doesn't mean that the insurance company is going to pay for it. It doesn't mean that they cover. So if it's coded as as a an orthopedic device uh, and it's it's only for knee surgeries, it's not for shoulder surgeries, then it's not covered for for that. Even though it could be used there, um, it's not. The insurance companies don't cover it. It could be covered. It could cover shoulders, but the insurance companies don't pay for it. So it, that is definitely a strategy that needs to be paid attention to. So I gave you a couple of uh, links down before, uh, down below, planning for successful medical device re reimbursement and top tips in medical reimbursement. So after you've done all this and you just found out that uh, that your reimbursement strategy and your uh, your uh, business uh, business plan is costing you more money. You go back to the bank and you find out you're you're really low on funds, and so now you have to come up and and uh, get more funds to to do all this. Um, if you've made some changes that require more testing, you're going to need more funds. So uh, the the uh, question is, what's your company now worth? What's the value of your contribution? What's the value of your patents? What's the value of the FDA strategy? What's the value of the production and all the things that you've put into this at this point? Uh, minus the sales, because sales may not be uh, uh, might, may not be there. As a matter of fact, they're probably not here yet, because I'm assuming at this point in the process you have not received FDA uh, clearance or approval for your device, and you're going to need uh, to still be in uh, uh, the pre-sales mode. So there are many approaches for valuing companies. One is value added. That's that's the uh, that's all the pieces to the puzzle that you need to have uh, present. Uh, that's the foundation of your company: the uh, quality assurance, uh, uh, the quality uh, plan, the way that your documentations are set up, your intellectual property, uh, the uh, um, any studies that you've done that have been positive. Another way is to do the market approach. It's a billion dollar market and uh, and there are people in that market and so you're going to go into a uh, either a crowded market or a very open market. There's an income approach where you're actually looking at how much you're bringing in 
in or potential for bringing in and a cost uh, approach so that you're going to be able to uh, save people money. Uh, and, and that's going to be done through several different ways. Uh, uh, if you're looking at the, the cost, it says, can I reduce the, the procedural cost? So if it is a CAFT procedure and you're looking at a CPT code and you say that you, the, the, the existing devices cost $10,000 and yet my product can achieve the same thing for $100, there is a huge cost uh, benefit for that. Or if you can reduce what are called the hospital readmissions, uh, that's kind of a secondary uh, part of this. But if, if people don't come back because your product works better than the, uh, than the competition, you're, you're uh, reducing uh, downstream costs, which are a little bit harder to, to uh, put your finger on. But uh, when you do that, you'll find out that uh, that there's an economic advantage to using your product over someone else, all of the things being equal. Keep in mind that value divided by the number of issued shares, these are the cost per share. Uh, you can do this with percentages also. So if any of you watch uh, the Shark Tank, you always see that they, one of the first things they ask you, or the first things that they say is I'm asking for a million dollars for 10% of my company. That's a $10 million valuation. And the first question they always ask is, how did you get that $10 million? So we'll go into that just a, in, in the next couple of slides. How to increase early phase valuation. Have a good regulatory strategy. Is it, list, is it a listed product, which is class one, which is under general controls, or a clearance product, class two, that's uh, uh, general controls plus special controls, and approvals, uh, FDA approval class three, that's your PMA devices, and this is uh, pre-market approval, which requires uh, uh, a much more uh, robust interaction with the FDA. The class two devices are pretty standard. They're about, uh, I believe it's over 40% of them that are issued today are class twos. Uh, most of them are class ones, and uh, uh, the smaller percentage is the class three. Um, by way of approval times, the class twos will cost you between 60 and 90 days from the time that you file. Uh, there is a requirement that you that you have a predicate device that you have somebody else's product you can compare yours to, as a, as opposed to the approval of class three, which is you're kind of out there all by yourself, and the FDA is seeing this for the first time through a uh, an FDA um, uh, uh, compliance officer who has who has become a, kind of your counselor at the FDA to help you design these these studies and uh, get this these products to approved. The other way for increasing early phase valuation is, is to uh, push your quality system so that you are starting off with a good quality management philosophy. And uh, uh, this, is, this has been, over the last 30 years, has become uh, an essential part of, uh, of, of a process because a, a bad product out in the market can kill your, pro kill your company even though it's doing very well. One, one bad experience. Uh, will especially in this in this digital age, we uh, it'll go into social media, and all of a sudden you're going to have to be looking at uh, either rebranding your company or uh, starting over. Um, you want to have quality throughout. By by throughout, I mean documentation, policies, procedures, records, the uh, the the entire package that we've been talking about. And so, the four webinars worth of links and uh, and uh, discussion on the documentation system and what needs to be uh, in, inside of that uh, um, documentation package. Uh, the design controls is one of them based on risk. Everything today in the FDA is based on risk. Risk analyses uh, are, um, uh, goes into every aspect of your product and company uh, and it, there's risk to the patient, there's risk to the product, there's risk to production and there's risk to your capital. Uh, the design has to get to a point where you transfer it to production and it's called a, a manufacturing handoff where the design engineers of the design group, whether they, they're the same guys that just change hats or whether it's another group within your organization, they, they, at some point you need to transfer this to production. And if there's still a lot to do, uh, usually your production guys kind of uh, uh, resist that because they know that they're going to have to go in and make changes. Uh, and again, changes are expensive. Um, getting into a working prototype that represents your final uh, design. You need to have those. Uh, 
the, representing your final product, the, the, these prototypes are going to be used for some things we'll be discussing in, in a few slides down where we're looking at uh, sterilization validations and package validations. So if you're working prototype, uh, let's say it's two inches long and uh, your final, your final de de device is uh, uh, 24 inches long, you're uh, in a big world of hurt because your package doesn't fit anymore and you got to go back and redo all your packaging and all your validations everything else so you can't just size and uh, and structure your product and no last minute changes you know that's uh, it's it's hard to hold to that because if you have a uh, if you're looking out for your intellectual property and you're constantly going after uh, or keeping a review and somebody walks in at the, at the 11th hour and they say, hey guys, we can't go down this road and design it like that because there's a patent on it. And uh, they're not willing to, uh, to cross license. And so you have to go back and change your design. Uh, that really hurts, but it happens. And uh, uh, so the best you can do is, is get your diligence done early so that you can minimize these last minute changes. And then the next, the next one is to create a production plan, how you're going to manufacture this. And, and uh, uh, this is all, remember, this is all occurring before the handoff to, to production and sales. This is, uh, this is preparing to commercialize, is to come up with a plan. How are you going to build it? Is it going to be a cell-based uh, manufacturing concept? Is it, will it be scalable? And the reason I put these two in is because these are keywords that investors like to hear. If it's going to take a very special um, manufacturing process uh, and the size of your clean room is going to have to be the size of a football field, uh, they kind of shy away from those because with complexity comes a lot of risk. So you keep it simple and, and a, and a cell-based manufacturing means that you can do this in a, small, in a small space. Let's say a 10 by 10 portable clean room is a whole lot better than having to build a building around it. So in the 10 by 10 portable clean room, uh, you can do an awful lot, and so you 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 uh, set this up under the cell-based lean manufacturing concept that you can scale up when when the sales demand it. You can scale it up, and and then you can go to the bigger building, or to or you can increase the number of cells. The most valuable asset of the company at this point is your stock, or is your equity in the company. So you know, I like this. What's in your wallet? Uh, in, in a startup company, probably not much because you probably put all your money into the company. And uh, speaking from experience on several occasions, I've done eight, eight startups so far. And uh, uh, they all require, uh, uh, all require money and, and usually at the beginning when your value is low, you don't want to give away half your company and raise $100,000. Uh, that's, that's not a good strategy. So you try to fund it, uh, it's called uh, uh, seed funding, angel funding, or just uh, bootstrapping and, uh, and uh, get the value up before you start to, uh, um, start to look for uh, money outside in the, in the private equity um, uh, uh, market. Now, equity financing, if you do have to go down that road, and assuming that you're at the point to where you're going to raise cash, there are many different ways to do that, and you need to understand the different uh, tools that you have at your disposal. One is um, it, it, at, at this is uh, called safe financing, and uh, that this one is relatively new. It's under the Y Combinator. Um, this is a method for preserving uh, as much equity for the founders as you can. Uh, it is founder friendly, as opposed to say the convertible note, which is a little less founder friendly. Bridge financing, again, even less founder friendly. Bank loans, you're going to pay, you're going to pay interest on, if you can get them. They'll even loan it to you. Uh, selling common stock is a, a years ago. That's the way I did it. I sold common stock in the beginning, uh, and, uh, and and raised my first two million dollars uh, uh, that way. Um, and my second two million went as a common stock sale as well, and uh, and then we uh, got into a preferred stock, and uh, the preferred stock carries with it certain preferences. And uh, what happens as you as you start to to sell pieces of your company, if you don't have a good plan uh, to get to to uh, profitability, and you run out of cash, then all of a sudden the the uh, cost of of your uh, 
the cost to you personally for selling that that stock is very very costly that's why I say it's the most valuable asset you have so don't get in a hurry to give away your company how do investors lose uh, loss of control how do you do that I gave away 50% plus one vote if you if you if you capitalize your company and you're in a stock situation it's 50% of the shares that are outstanding and issued and there are and you have one more vote that's all it takes to control the company well, that may not be a big deal if you have friendly uh, uh, friendly investors but at the end of the day they are going to be controlling something that is probably not anything anybody has is worried about and that's the capitalization table when you have control of the company you have the ability to change the capitalization table so if I if I want to increase uh, let me let me go back to the to the uh, to the part that's probably most of most interest when you capitalize your company, let's assume that you capitalize your company for a million shares of stock. You think the company is worth a million dollars. You, you, you put out a million shares, so you can very easily do that math. It's one dollar per share. Okay, so you put out a million shares of stock and you sold all of it for a million dollars. You have zero percent left for you. You've given it all away. So you don't do that. You give up 500,000 shares and you sell it for $500,000. You put the money in the bank. You now have capital to uh, proceed forward to uh, to a uh, uh, to a different phase in the in the in the uh, company. However, you've given up fifty percent of your company. All of this is is referred to as um, capital stock. Now you have you have issued stock and you have authorized stock. You can authorize ten million shares of stock to be issued, but you've on, you've only actually issued. 1 million shares and that would be 500,000 to your investor and 500,000 to yourself. You have 9 million shares of stock left that you've authorized when you had control of the company you authorized that um, 900,000 shares to me, uh, 9 million shares of stock you authorized for future issuance. Now that's where that's where control of the company becomes critical because when you had control of the company, you could change that. When you give up that 50% plus one vote, they can change it. And so they look at the cap table and they say, we don't want to authorize 10 million shares, we want to authorize 100 million shares. And now all of a sudden, the tables have turned on you and, and the value of your stock has just gone, uh, has been uh, uh, diluted or has potential for dilution of 10x. So is that is is that something you want to do but it's it's very common that this is what they will do by selling um, selling more of the company they may be the investors who will buy it for themselves and put in and instead of 50 50 percent plus one vote they now own 60 percent 70 percent when they have that much control in the company your your value your equity is going down theirs is going up and they have complete control of your company and uh, so what I'm saying is uh, how investors lose is not wanting to give up some equity. You got to give up some, but don't give it all away, and don't give up much. That's why it's so important to build that value so quickly. And the other is read the contract and read it real carefully, line by line. There are <clears throat> these these people that write these contracts are usually educated lawyers who know how to write contracts, and if they're writing it for the investor, they're not your friend, and they write to protect. The people who pay their their pay their salaries or their their uh, pay their bills, and they write these things to protect them. <clears throat> so if if you think that <clears throat> the contracts are written to protect you, uh, read it twice and look for areas that can be uh, uh, hurtful to you personally. Um, and and in, in, I'll go into how you can protect yourself in a second, but. Um, you, you do want to look at these contracts. Um, uh, personal experience where I did not have the ability to read contracts uh, that, were, that had a direct effect on me because I wasn't a, uh, a majority shareholder in the company cost me dearly. And uh, uh, so you look at you look at the cap table. You look and see where you're at and where you, where you can uh, increase these valuations. This is all building up. This has nothing to do with your with your product. Hopefully, your product is strong enough to where it can support building value early. Um, you have to look at whether or not in the cap table you're going to put it in shares, percentages, or units. 
And once you start to sell this stock, you actually <clears throat> put yourself under the Securities and Exchange Commission, which means that you have to register your company. And in that, it's going to say who really owns the company and what leverage can you build into that deal. You're going to go back to your product <clears throat> at some point and say, uh, I'm ready to go to marketing. Did I, did I um, meet my uh, user specification? And if I met my user specification, did I, did, does my output meet the user needs and intended use? And in other words, did I make the right product? So did I make the product right? And did I make the right product? Two different things, okay? That's the design verification, design validation. These need to be in your design file that show that you have verified and validated your process, that the process meets, meets specification. Okay, uh, sorry for the, uh, the little dogs. Uh, protecting your product. Intellectual property is not enough. Sometimes if you get into a problem with intellectual property, you're, you're going to have to do some licensing because maybe you're not free to operate. Maybe your, your uh, product uh, infringes a little bit or all on somebody else's stuff. Um, what you want to do, in, in, and I put down in parentheses, your project, because at this point, hopefully, the, product is, in the project is still yours. Um, licensing rights, return of the license for failure to perform. Look at your, as you look at these contracts, and you're going to look at these licensing agreements, and at some point you're going to be required to license the product to the company. If you've built your own company, you're going to license it to that company. And before investors will invest, they want to make sure that the licensing rights have been properly transferred. However, there are ways to protect yourself at this phase without, uh, without affecting the investors. The, the way you do that is you create uh, clauses inside your licensing agreement that says that if for whatever reason this, this device has been um, shelved, the, the, uh, the licensee decides that, uh, um, that they're not going to push your product, uh, the sales are lagging, uh, you get it back. And that's, that's important. I mean, it's, you, you, if, if you can get your project back, you can go and market it again. Um, you want to uh, keep that in mind because most of these uh, uh, license agreements, and I've signed many of them, say for valuable consideration. And they say, well, what's the valuable consideration? Well, it's a dollar. I say, you're kidding me. I don't even get a, a, pa a plaque for my patent. But for a dollar, I have given up the rights. So I have... Uh, I, I know the uh, moderator said that we had uh, 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 25 patents issued. It's actually well over 30, 35 patents because I have a lot in, in the patent uh, uh, cooperation treaty and in, in international patents. But none of mine did I put this in. And I wish I, I had because they're making other people money and I have no rights back to the patent. I, you've pretty much given your, your life away on those, those patents. That's, uh, you have no recourse. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the timing of your publications, if you, if you publish too soon, uh, the, the, the information is out there, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's old information, et cetera. So um, keep that also in mind, that you want to time your publication. You want to be able to uh, say enough to be published. Um, Excuse me. Say enough to get funded. Say nothing to preserve. Say nothing to preserve intellectual property, and that's that's the tough part because your lawyers will say, "Don't say anything about your product because maybe you haven't got your patents issued yet." But if you're going to raise money, you got to say something about your product. So you have to say enough to get funded, but try not to go too deep and try not to get yourself into a legal di dilemma because in today's world. Um, under intellectual property, you have, uh, going down to this one, it's first to file versus first to conceive. That changed a couple of years ago at the patent office where we could use our lab books to prove conception. Uh, however, now it's been changed to more uh, parallel what's going on in Europe. And it used to be this way in the U.S. It's, there was a race to the patent office to see who could file first. 
So if somebody hears of your idea and they and they go and they check and it hasn't been filed and they throw a patent on it, you may wake up and find out somebody's stolen your stolen your your, uh, uh, your patent because they've got a prior date for filing. So uh, keep everything that you have uh, before before you have your your patents issued under non-disclosure agreements. Those non-disclosure agreements. There's a there's an individual in Scottsdale who won, I believe, it's a little over seven hundred million dollars because of an infringement on a on a uh, uh, patent uh, non-disclosure form. He didn't even have a patent issue, but they he had, he had had the company that he disclosed it to file an NDA, and they went ahead and tried to run around him. And this happens. So know that going in, keep keep your eyes open going in. Um, inventorship. Need to understand uh, that patents and inventorship uh, need to be very well understood because uh, a lot of times uh, people will put inventors on just people who are in the room breathing the same air. There are requirements for in inventorship. Um, in in every patent, every patent needs to have at least one claim and it, one independent claim to be a patent, and the inventors have to have uh, personally contributed to that claim or have collaborated on the claim. If that's not the case, you can't just throw uh, the secretary of the company on there or somebody in marketing who, who, uh, who, who thought that they're having their name on a patent was a good idea. Uh, that would be kind of cool to have my name on a patent. Well, I mean, you can do that, but it's, it's not legal. And uh, what happens is if, if somebody who is disgruntled decides to go to the patent office and challenge that patent, they can go back in and they can actually take the patent review it and say that this was not properly submitted, that you're putting in people who didn't contribute to the patent, and you lose the patent. And uh, uh, the next one was patentability. Uh, there are what are called patentability opinions. Is the product really patentable? And how strong is the patent? These and these are opinions. They're not. They're, they're, the uh, caveat here is uh, that uh, nobody stands behind it very far. Uh, you'll end up going to court to defend it, and it's, it's going to be a, a war of words at that point. Freedom to operate, what does that mean? Well, in, when you're in, patent, uh, in the patent domain and you've got to, let's say you build a process for making your product, and in the process of, of making it, you're actually on somebody else's turf that has a patent on how to do something, how to make, uh, uh, how to make the, the, uh, the device. I'll give you a good example that was given to me. Uh, I'm going to build a, a, a stool. The stool has three legs and a, and a seat. I can patent that. I'm the first one to the market and I got a patent on it. Somebody else comes along and they say, wait a second, I can build a four-legged stool. It's more stable and uh, I'm going to put arms and a back on, on the seat for comfort. Well, he's going to get a patent on it. So now you've got a guy who's got a patent on a four-legged stool is he able to build it? And the answer is no, because he's not free to operate. Because at some point in his manufacturing process, he has to have put a, a seat and three legs on the stool, and that um, has violated the, the patent number one, which is uh, the guy with the three-legged stool. So what do you do at that point? Well, you go back to the guy with three legs on the stool, and, and you work out a licensing agreement, uh, or a cross-licensing agreement. Or he will say no, and you're stuck. So the other, the other eight ways on the intellectual property is trademarks, copyrights. Uh, trademarks, uh, there's actually a process for trademarks uh, to, to follow. Um, the, uh, um, there's the, it's called the, uh, the Patent and Trademark Office. So uh, that, that can be done online, and they're, they're fairly easy to research. Uh, be aware, though, that trademarks, there's a lot of different areas that you can trademark into. And uh, you need to be very def uh, definitive as to where you want your mark to be. Uh, small entity status: be aware that as a small business, you do have some some uh, um, some advantages as to what uh, what to the cost may be and a lot of this stuff. So look into small entity status to find out whether your company qualifies. Uh, provisional patents: <clears throat> a lot of people. Uh, say, oh yeah, I, I, they ask if you've got a patent filed on it. Yeah, I've got a provision, provisional patent pending. Uh, wait a second, that's not the right words to use because uh, provisional patents aren't pending. You have to file a, uh, a, a patent. A provisional patent is like a, a, a placeholder. It holds, it holds your place in line 
and shows that you were you were at the patent office first, and you are limited as to what you can say in your final patent. It has to you can't add additional uh, additional art into your final patent. Your provisional patent pretty much has to have what you're going to patent in there, but it gives you one year to get your actual patent written. Again, this is this country is turned to first to file. Um, you need to be well documented. Use use your lab books and, and good documentation, and understand the uh, uh, the concept of licensing and cross licensing, not just for yourself, but also if you have to do that to get your product off off the ground. I, I put in a bunch of links here. Uh, this is uh, 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 this is to do a patent landscape search. So if you are in, in doing this, and, you, and this is, I put this in this portion of the webinar because uh, you're going to be doing this the entire time that you're developing the product. Is you want to keep you want to keep somebody working on what's really out there. Now you can do that yourself under these different portals um, and these landscape searches. Uh, uh, Google has one now that uh, allows you to go in uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and and do a uh, uh, actually it. it it's constantly searching for you, uh, but there's also um, uh, how to do it. Here's at the bottom here. It's a patent search tutorial, how to uh, search online. And uh, company, there are companies who actually do this down at the bottom. It's a company called NIRAC, Planet Patent, National Patent Services, and Google Advanced Patent Search. So you can, you can set this up to where they're looking for keywords. Now, it's all based upon how well you can define those keywords. So if you already have a patent application with claims, filing the PCT will cost approximately $3,500. That's a, a patent cooperation treaty, which is a European patent. To file in the US, it's considerably less than that. Uh, I believe it's about $400 right now. And that's only, a, in, the, in the European area, this is only a filing fee. Once you file your company, in, in your, your patent in Europe, there are more fees for every named country on the patent, and it could be somewhere in the neighborhood of eighty to hundred thousand dollars worth of fees once they get into the examination phase. So every company is going to, every country is going to have its own fee. So I put in a, a slide here, and you can read this at your at your uh, uh, convenience. But the idea of freedom to operate, uh, um, patentability, as well as uh, freedom to operate. Excuse me just a second. Um, it's uh, the freedom to operate is is important as well as the uh, um, the patentability to understanding what this is and these are th these are services that your your patent attorney will um, your patent attorney will be uh, very familiar with. Uh, but be aware that uh, freedom to operate opinions can cost twenty to thirty thousand and more. So I, I give you a nice link down here: this IPWatchdog.com difference between patent searches and infringement and clearance. So uh, you do not get uh, much more than I looked at. What I looked at, I don't see any problems. However, I may not have seen everything. So they they do they do that add that in the last paragraph. Um, in, in your preparation for commercialization, you need to understand what your responsibility is under the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR 820.20, .20, Management Responsibility. And so I cited this here. Uh, each manufacturer should provide adequate resources, including the assignment of trained personnel for management, performance of work, assessment activities, including internal quality audits, to meet the requirements of this part. Now, in, in prior uh, webinars, I actually uh, gave you that uh, uh, CFR 820. So if you don't have that or didn't attend the, the prior one, uh, please go. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Rebecca will be uh, posting the links to all of these um, so that you can get these uh, these uh, these links. Uh, but this is this is a uh, this is under the FDA Act under the Code of Federal Regulations, and during an FDA audit. This is what they're going to look for. Did you provide adequate resources? And if if you do not have adequate resources, um, they usually uh, close you down until you put those resources in place. Okay. Once you, you know your 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 quality system and your quality management system is starting to uh, to move forward, you've got your documentations uh, your documentation being being developed as well as. Uh, uh, your, your documentation has has, uh, uh, has defined your different policies under uh, 
the uh, FDA's 820, and you're starting to put this, if you go back to this slide, it says uh, uh, assessment activities. So this is what you want to assess. And this is the first one is corrective and preventive action. Do you have a method for doing that? Uh, is there management review and looking at trend analysis and the proper action was taken? Trend analysis uh, can be something as simple as how many complaints did we have in the, in the last month? Do you have a system set up to do that? Because if you launch before you have the system, you're not going to be able to monitor this. So once you launch your product and you start to see sales coming in, you, you may or may not have complaints. How do you handle those? How do you review those? So that's done under the management review meeting. That management re review umbrella is, is very large because it also, uh, in, the, in the one on production that we uh, talked about, uh, the management review is actually looking at production rejects production issues, yields, and uh, in other areas as to see if, if our production process is properly validated and verified. Uh, quarantine, what do we do with quarantine? What are our trends? And the bottom one was kind of the, the first, don't get carried away and put so much burden on your system that it's going to be impossible for you to administrate a, uh, a quality system. What you want to do is keep the burden low as, uh, wherever possible. So. Um, you don't need to, places where you don't need to have uh, 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 um, policies and procedures in place. I worked for a company years ago when we had a procedure on how to rent a car, how to rent a hotel room, uh, how to how, how to get a cab. You don't need to do that. That's too much. If this is all this stuff is supposed to be at the at the at the minimum. It has to do with the quality. Anything that has to do with the quality of your product. Well, one of the big things that has to do with your quality of your product is your package because your product is not just what you're putting in the package, it is the package as well. It's everything that's in that box, including the box. So if you have labeling, if you have um, uh, um, package lidding, why is that important? Um, the, product, the package protects the product and its sterility to the final point of use. So that's, that's the requirement. It has to do that. Is it breathable? Uh, does light matter? Does it bother it? Can I get contamination through it? Uh, labeling ink. I had a product when I was in cardiovascular that was uh, 5,000 units had to be recalled because the label ink, the stuff we printed the label with, reacted with the ethylene oxide during sterilization and created a toxic substance. Well, all of a sudden, now the question is, can it get through my, my uh, Tyvek pouch? And if the answer is, well, maybe, well, uh, that's going to contaminate my product. What if it gets on the hands of the nurse who's handling it with her gloves? Well, now you've got an, another issue. So you have to look at all of these things and saying that my pouch, my package, my labeling, my product inside, uh, how, they're, how they are uh, stored, all of this matters because it's all part of the big, the big picture. Um, the seal that you use to seal your product requires validations. That's under ISO 11607. There's a bunch of these that will be uh, given later as far as the ISO, but you need to understand what your, what your responsibility is. You also need to consider <coughs> the uh, uh, disposable, disposal of the used package. How, you know, if, you're, uh, if you are <coughs> ecologically friendly, <coughs> these should be um, biodegradable without affecting the environment. And there are, there are those packages out there. <clears throat> Packaging and sterilization is, is uh, one of the ones that can hit people in the back of the head because you got the product, you put it in a pouch, you say, okay, this is good, all we have to do now is sterilize it. No, that's not true. You can sterilize it, but you need to make sure that the sterilization worked. Okay? You have to make sure that the process didn't affect the product, the adhesives or the ink to label it. You have to use, you have different uh, options. Steam sterilization, gamma, e-beam, ethylene oxide, and plasma. All of these have to be looked at to see if, if you have one that's preferred. You just don't throw something into the sterilizer without understanding its effect on your product and your package. Uh, uh, some of the packages can't take steam. The high temperature will melt the package. Uh, bio burden control, how to keep track of how much uh, bio burden, and that's, that's a biological uh, uh, con contribution that's occurred during production and packaging. That comes off of people's hands from their skin because you've got exposed arms. And if you see a high bio level, you've got you've to start tightening your controls. 
uh, the sterility is required to maintain sterility over the life of the package. Um, and that's because the package is usually the one that has the shortest uh, uh, lifespan. However, if you have a short um, uh, shelf life on your product inside, it's, if it's a biologic, for instance, then you're, you're, you have to have sterility over the life of the, of the entire product. Uh, sterility assurance levels of 10 to the minus 6, this means one out of a million can show a, uh, uh, um, one out of a million uh, packages may test positive for a bacteria. It doesn't mean it's infected, it just means that they, they might find one there. So that's one out of a million. So, uh, that's, that's the FDA's uh, level uh, for uh, sterility. Um, the FDA clearance and your, or your approval will all uh, be contingent upon the total package, so you can't forget these things. Uh, proper labeling indications and contraindications. Uh, this is the first time you've seen this, this uh, um, phrase, but it's what it can't be used for, and that has to be as well on your labeling. ISO 11607 has a very good, excuse me, that has, uh, has very good um, um, information on how to do this. Um, Approximately, this is the FDA focuses on this because they have years of data that implicate failures in primary packaging. And forty percent of the forty-seven percent of the failures occur due to inadequate inadequate package validation programs. So, if I was a betting man, uh, I would say that would be one that we would want to keep uh, high on our list uh, for uh, in, in our design process to make sure our package validation program is in place and it's functional. So a little brief on the package validation. Um, all medical device materials and drugs have a finite lifespan and all materials such as plastics, adhesives, and polymers degrade with time. And uh, most medical devices have a primary and a secondary packaging system. It means that one is inside of another pouch. And the reason for that is so you can open that inside of the, uh, inside of the OR where you move from the uh, non-sterile field into a sterile field and you can drop the product into the sterile field without contaminating the rest of what's in there, uh, which could be instrumentation and a lot of other stuff, including the surgeon. So all of these systems, the primary and secondary packaging system, require validation programs. So there's a good link to how to do that. Accelerated aging, uh, you have to have real-time aging as well as accelerated aging. So real-time is that if you have it, if you have a bunch of product made, you put it on the shelf and you hold it, you set it aside and say, I'm going to hold this product uh, for five years and every year I'm going to pull it out, I'm going to test it. It has to perform the same way as the original product or uh, if it's accelerated aging, that's, that's where you can do this in about five to six months to get a five-year shelf life uh, by accelerating the conditions and that's increasing the, um, the temperature and uh, the humidity of the product provided your packaging will allow you to do that. Um, your requirement is that you do both. You have to do accelerated aging as well as real-time aging. So you're looking at um, Arrhenius' equation. For every 10% increase in temperature, doubles the rate of chemical reaction. And you look at test temperature, ambient temperature, uh, reaction rate factor, real-time equivalent. And at the end of the shelf life, you want to, or, or during the shelf life, and at the end, at the end, you want to verify sterility and performance. Because if if you go to three years and you didn't check it, you waited until five years and it fails, you don't know if maybe you could have got a three or a four year shelf life if you would have tested at those time points. Some of the testing that's required, uh, um, it's, it's it includes but not limited to a visual inspection test, a peel strength test, a burst test. That's this one right here. The one on top of the burst test is a peel strength where you pull the pull the, 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 uh, um, uh, the seal apart. This represents what's called an unsupported peel test. There are supported peel tests, so there's a lot to be learned about this. Uh, a dye penetration test over the far right, uh, and a uh, bubble point test, a bubble emission test where you actually submerge it. You've got to create a tank full of water, and then you pump these things up with water, and you see if, if the, around the seals if you have a leak. That has to be done, and you have to, you have to look at all these tests. Then there's shipping tests that have to be done as well. And those all, again, all this has to be done before you can go to commercialization. This is, can I ship it? And it's drop tests, vibration tests, compression tests, atmospheric conditioning, and low pressure. Because these things, a lot of our products go up in the air, and they're flown around the country, so we need to test those 
And whether you do these or whether you send them to uh, test labs, there are test labs, we'll do it now, um, but to test it as far as cargo. Uh, labeling, again, another essential part of this. You can actually get your product recalled because of poor, poor or inadequate labeling. Uh, today we have barcoding. This is a barcode that you can get uh, uh, for every U, uh, uh, SKU that you have. And now you have to have what's called a unique device identifier. Uh, and so uh, I put in a link here all you need to know about uh, UDIs. And uh, uh, your labeling also includes your instructions for use and possibly your brochure. So all of this will be submitted to the FDA. Um, here's uh, an overview of device labeling. Uh, that's a pretty good link. Uh, the claims, what does the product do? What's its intention? What's its intended use? If it's a medical, if it's to treat a medical condition, your intended use then is to treat a medical condition. It does fall under the, the uh, Section 820. What constitute mislabeling? A lot of people fall into this trap. Uh, a lot of guys uh, in, in the marketing get involved in this and they put stuff on the uh, label that shouldn't be there because they don't understand Section 820. So I put that in here, uh, the, uh, the guidance document for general device labeling. Um, box label, the IFU, and what about marketing brochures? Well, your marketing brochure cannot say more than what your indications for use has given you right to say. And they will look at that. The FDA does go in and they look at your marketing brochures as well as they will tour a lot of the places where you're, where you're showing these things looking for violations. Shelf life, I just wanted to, I've got to speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time. And by the way, this is a huge endeavor when you're trying to bring a medical device to market because as you can see, it's taken four, four webinars and we're not even, uh, we're just barely scratching the surface on this. Uh, but here's some information. Uh, it has to be uh, real-time accelerated. It must be on the product itself and it must be on the label. You have to put this back on this label. If you look here at the label, it says single, single use, sterile, and expiration date right here in the upper right. There's an expiration date. Uh, that's when uh, it expires. And um, that doesn't mean that the product is bad at that point. It just means that you're not going to warranty the product beyond that because you don't have any data under the shelf life um, that takes you out to this. So if your shelf life took it to three years, but you know your product lasts for five years, you still can't say it will last for five years until you get to the five-year point where you can actually prove it. So probably the best example of, of good shelf life is uh, Twinkies. So uh, who would have guessed our product might have a longer shelf life than our company because Twinkies went out of business there just recently. I think they're just now coming back. Uh, you need to test shelf life in extreme conditions, uh, dry, wet, and cold. This is for your uh, real-time aging. Um, and you have to redo the performance testing. Uh, verification and validation. Uh, design validation, what really happens near the end of the design, or the redesign of a medical product. It answers the question, does the design solution actually perform and function as I intended it to, and does it meet my user needs? We discussed that just briefly earlier, but this is a little bit more detailed. Design verification provides the theoretical assurance that the design is appropriate in regards to your, designed, your divide, defined design input requirements Validation provides evidence beyond the theoretical that the device you designed is truly safe and effective within the context of the same design input requirements. Now, what does all this mean? Because we've gone through a lot of stuff. Look at the bottom. This is your. This is the, what you're building, and this is my vision of, of, a, of a corporation, for instance. That your, your foundation or your clinical studies, your new products, your advisory boards, your scientific research, your website, regulatory patents, and product production scalability, these are some of the uh, foundational things that will help build some initial valuation, but what really pushes your valuation up, and I, again, reference to Shark Tank, to how much have you sold? We look at group purchasing organizations, original equipment manufacturers, military, nursing homes, prime vendors, independent distributors, as all being part of the, of the distribution potential for our product to push revenue and sales, and that carries your valuation uh, and, and can continue to grow. You've, you've got a good foundation, and this is this is the way you get uh, uh, more uh, more value for your idea than just an idea that's going to be uh, sold as a product. So you'll see a lot of times this is building a company. This is not just building a product. 
Remember that there are early adopters and you're going to be down here for a long time. That this is, this is where you've got to make the jump over this little chasm where the early adopters then start to tweet or to, uh, to use social media to get the early majority into your uh, technology um, and they get it adopted. And then hopefully these are the guys at the end of the, the, the curve, the late majority and laggards. Uh, those are going to be your last stage, and this is what's going to keep your company uh, uh, moving slowly. These are the ones that will make get, get your company moving fast. No medical device. Uh, I, I put this in because it's important that you always keep this in mind, that no medical device can be legally marketed before you have oops, FDA clearance or approval for a Class 2 or Class 3 device. Class 2s are cleared, Class 3s are approved, and and no medical device can be legally marketed until you're compliant with the FDA QSRs. So that is uh, really what sets medical devices uh, apart from all other products, uh, whether they're uh, toys or, uh, or household goods. Registering for the FDA, I'm putting this in because you're going to need this because before, before you, you go to market, you need to uh, register with the FDA. Uh, you should have this probably before you file your 510K. Uh, or your PMA, uh, and it gives you an idea here how to do that. Uh, okay, if there's any questions on that, my email is jeff.skiba at gmail.com, and I can just uh, uh, talk to you over the phone or the email on how to, how to do this and whether or not you need, you need to do this. Uh, working with the FDA, there's a lot of things that they're going to be asking. I put this back in as it's a review slide, uh, so understand the guidance documents, your, your classification, your need for pre-submission meetings with the FDA, and whether or not you can fast track or whether you can actually put this into a humanitarian use uh, um, product. Product after sale, when, once you get into sales and you're starting to do it, the FDA does require a pre-market or post-market surveillance. This is where you look at your product and how well it's being used and are you seeing any problems and is your user specification being met. So uh, the post-market surveillance is a collection of processes and activities the FDA uses to monitor safety and efficacy of medical devices once they are on the market. So that is important for you to understand that you're, you're, even though you've got the FDA clearance or approval on it, you're not done yet because this post-market uh, surveillance, this is why they have these UDIs now, the unique device identifier codes, so that they can, that you can facilitate this. Startup issues, there's a lot of issues that you're going to see. Uh, but it, it, do you have a good plan? Is your business plan comprehensive? You're going to be in a starvation. It's feast or famine in startups. Uh, be be uh, be aware that this the stress level in this is uh, rivals any final exam you'll ever take in college. Keep your costs down. Build value. Uh, founder relationships. Uh, typical costs of bringing in an investor. You're going to find that there's a lot of people that like to. I like to tell you they're, they're gonna, they can raise you the money, but it's going to cost you. So it's going to cost you twice. It's going to cost you for the guy who brings the money in, and it's going to cost you for the guys who actually put that in. So kind of like uh, um, uh, they call these linkers. And at the very end of the, of the uh, issue is who's actually running the company. And you, you don't want to uh, uh, be ambiguous there. Make sure that there's somebody steering the boat. Too many hands on the steering wheel and the company doesn't run pro properly. So when you're ready to transfer to production, you want to uh, uh, freeze the design. Make sure your design files are in place. Get your de device history files that are ready because you're going to have to start monitoring everything that was done for each lot that you made. And in an audit situation, one of the first things they go to is show me your device history records. Show me how you built your product. And did you follow your design file? Make sure that your uh, FDA cleared or approved and your inventory levels are clear, your reorder points are clear, and your bookkeeping is in place. The legal has reviewed your IP, trademarks, and contracts. And this has to happen. And I would put down also uh, the legal has reviewed your website, if you have a website. Because if you do have trademarks or copyright information, then uh, that's important that they uh, that they review that to make sure you're not stepping off the cliff. You have to make sure the marketing has a clear direction that sales and sales collaterals are ready. The sales collaterals are like your brochures and your handouts. Uh, it'd be your website also. Insurances are in place. Bookkeeping is in place. Device tracking is in place. And you shift from an engineering-driven market to a market-driven 
uh, engineering driven design to market driven design because now your market is going to come back if there's going to be a, a, a version 2.0 the marketing market group comes back and say hey uh, everybody likes this but they would really like to have uh, this added to the kit or this added to the device or change this maybe they don't all like black they want to have one in blue can you make one in blue? Well, that'll be version 2.0, but it's coming. The, the the user spec is coming from your marketing group. A selection of a product is a dynamic strategy. Developing user needs, feasibility, reimbursement early. Look at the total project. Solving a problem is just the tip of the iceberg. You've got an awful lot of business stuff that's going to have to be covered, and you always underestimate your budget. So if you think you have, you think you know your budget, then double it, and you'll still be short. Uh, understand the complexity of your total project, and uh, that's why we did, gave these seminars. It's four seminars on under, try to understand a little bit better about the complexity of this, and I think it's been fairly comprehensive. Understand that time is money. Uh, for every month that you're not selling product, that you're still in the development mode, you're not selling product. You're not making money. You're spending money. Use experienced consultants where you can. Uh, valuation is the key, and a patent is not enough for valuation. You've got to build the foundation of the company. Go with the idea that you're going to sell this for a um, hundred million dollars, but design design the process such that if you don't get that big that guy with the big checkbook on your front door, that you can go ahead and continue to take it through uh, the the company building process and all of your foundations in place so that it can stand on its own. I, I brought some links uh, to be aware of. These are these are fairly new. AHRQ and Nice. These are uh, groups that are being uh, that are, have been formed that are actually reviewing new technology and actually creating a uh, a site where uh, they can uh, they can define standard of care. Now, whether they're going to be successful, we don't know, but it's something to be aware of because it will affect our companies uh, going forward, especially in medical devices. Uh, there's some good uh, links here that you're going to find uh, helpful. Uh, some more uh, how to how to avoid doom. Uh, medical device execs need to evolve now to avoid doom in the future. Uh, precision technology drives ev evolution of orthopedic devices, and here's one on sterility insurance levels. Uh, and finally, just don't get eaten. Uh, hopefully, this, uh, these webinars have been helpful to understand how to build this value. That was kind of my intent: was how to, how as an inventor or a founder of the company, you can build value that's unassailable by uh, the investors who will come in and just want to make money. Thank you for participating and uh, uh, if, you, if you can grab the links off of the uh, different webinars, I think they're worth keeping. So that's the end of uh, this session. Let's go to the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is a great um, presentation and a great recap of the others that we've had in this four-part FDA webinar series. I do want to remind everyone that we are taking questions now.